Uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Myers. I am one of the co-founders and CTO here at Gretel AI. Uh, I am pleased to present a panel here on large language models and their opportunities in generative artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm joined by uh, two amazing panelists here from the industry. Um, Danny Lang, who is a senior VP of artificial intelligence at Unity Technologies, and Jonathan Cohen, VP of applied research at NVIDIA. I'm really excited to get to talk to you guys and uh, pick your brains about LLMs today. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just get started with uh, introductions. Um, so if you guys don't mind, um, we'll start with uh, Danny and then Jonathan. Um, love to get a quick introduction about yourselves and um, you know where you're working, uh, what you're working on, and and specifically if you can talk a little bit about the type of work you're doing with large language models, uh, and then we'll we'll dive in after that. Yeah, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm Danny. I'm I'm uh, running a, a large part of AI at uh, Unity. We are a gaming platform company, uh, very very popular. I think that three quarters of uh, all mobile games are developed on our platform. Um, I've been in this space for a very very long time. Been six years at Unity. Before that, I was head of uh, AI at Uber, and prior to that, GM for machine learning at at Amazon, and launched services, first machine learning service in AWS. So I've been at this for a very long time. And the reason I bring it up is that I really think that large language models have. Uh, I have uh, accelerated the whole field uh, over the last few years. And uh, I think that uh, 2022 was a big uh, breakthrough year for, for large language models and, and therefore also for the whole concept of, of, of AI. I still, after all these years, struggle to say AI because it's such a broad concept. But I do think that large language models uh, are giving us a hint of of what's going to happen happen in the future, and and I I'm sure we will get back to a lot deeper into this uh, over the next half an hour. But at Unity, uh, uh, we are looking at large language models as as a very very inspiring and new and fascinating concept to add to video games, and and you can imagine that you will have much much. Uh, interesting interactions with your game when your NPCs they uh, they suddenly appear a lot smarter than they did yesterday. I'm uh, I'm Jonathan Cohen. Um, I've been at Nvidia. I started in 2008. Uh, I spent a couple of years at Apple, and then I came back to Nvidia. Um, I've done lots of things in my career. Uh, my my role right now is I oversee a couple R&D teams. Um, but including the effort to uh, develop the technology and then productize a, a platform uh, based around large language models. Um, you know, I think the the interest at NVIDIA, obviously so much of this work is done on our hardware platform and our, um, our software stack, NVIDIA AI, for training models and PyTorch and TensorFlow and QDNN to accelerate the training. Um, but if you think about what we do, what we do as a company, we build platforms for accelerated computing. So we we are interested in what are the things that people are doing with their computers. What's driving, you know, major workloads across, you know, all, all, all the places which computers are running from from uh, embedded to data centers. Um, what are the key computations, and then how do we make that run faster? And it, it seems clear to me that um, the the rise of systems that can understand human language is going to be, I, I believe, the most, the single most important workload for computers in the future. You know, all we do all day long, all we are doing right now is talk, we communicate, people communicate. And so um, automating the understanding of human communication is going to impact everything and it's going to run everywhere and do everything. Um, and it will allow us to automate things that um, perform tasks that could never have been performed before, automate uh, all sorts of you know, actions, create all sorts of new experiences from entertainment to enterprise to you know, empowering workers, empowering people. Um, and so the, you know, the role of NVIDIA in all this is, is we, we want to figure out what that's going to look like and build a platform to power all of that. And so, so my team is developing, uh, you know, laying the groundwork for, uh, for products that, that start to try to address that opportunity. Great, thanks so much. That's uh, 
that's uh, super insightful to hear. Um, so let's just kind of jump right in. So for the <clears throat> to get kind of started with a, a common baseline for the audience, um, how would you guys at a very high level describe what a large language model is? And then for comparison's sake, are there near peer models that um, you know you you would compare them or contrast them to? And um, you know, are there any strong arguments you know that um, you know illustrate kind of um, what LLMs are good for, what they're not good for. Yeah, maybe I can I can just um, answer some perspective, and I'm very curious what Danny thinks. Um, you know, people talk about these models that they, they people have started to use the term foundation models, and you know, I think a really good definition, working definition of a foundation model, as opposed to all the other neural networks and machine learning models we have, is something that out of the box can kind of do anything. It's like a universal model somehow. It's maybe not the best at everything. And, and you would always assume some very narrow tailored model you trained just to do this one thing is gonna be the best. But if you have one model that's just sort of generally good at everything and any task you throw at it, it can kind of do pretty well out of the box. That 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 is this foundation that you can then build all sorts of tools and, and processes and automation on top of. And I think, what what's emerged in the last really two years is um, this insight, uh, and you know I think there's a couple couple key people who really had this vision and and, and pushed on it. Ilya Sutskiver I think deserves tremendous credit from OpenAI. Um, that hey, if you take this like transformer architecture and just keep scaling it up and scaling it up, eventually it might kind of cross over into some model. You know, train it on enough data with enough compute and you know enough uh, neural net capacity. Eventually, the, you, you might have this model that can just kind of do anything you throw at it, and that turns out to kind of be true. And I think you know we're seeing the Chat GPT being this example that really jumped into the public consciousness because it's so easy to use. And and I think I think that's that's really what like is the quantum difference. You know, in some sense, these algorithms have been around for, for several years now, but it's really like, it turns out that at, at a certain scale, they, they become models that can just kind of do anything. And that's really quite impressive. Yeah, yeah, I really wanna, wanna, wanna take you up on that, Jonathan, because that is, uh, uh, it, it, that is something that, that is uh, uh, very unique for these models. Uh, I've, I've spent years and years in, in the space of reinforcement learning especially uh, in connection with games uh training uh, uh NPCs and 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 uh, to 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 move in games to move in 3D we've used a lot of reinforcement learning for that and and one of the things that we would consistently run into is that these models they kind of over optimize on what they see and then they forget what they previously learned yeah uh it's 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 a bit like like little children yeah the 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 neural networks get very very quickly reordered and they get very good at the next task and the previous task is just gone yeah and this is something that has really uh, bothered us for years yeah and then we see large language models having this exact capability that we have been looking for, which is I can learn and learn and learn and learn, and I remember it all. Yeah, and um, it 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 what it does tell me, by the way, and this is unrelated to large language models, is that maybe there is something we can learn from from those models that we can incorporate back into other other models that. Uh, that allows us to achieve this foundational concept, yeah, uh, that uh, maybe language models is showing us the way on that. Um, but I think that's a very, very, very important aspect that these models are foundational and they can be used uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, very diverse uh, domain, uh, you know, domain space. Uh, and that's that's new. We're not being used to that with 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 all the previous models. Whether that has been for you know uh, uh, advertisement targeting or, or or game testing gameplays using reinforcement learning, et cetera, is is all these models have had a tendency to be very specialized. And the moment you just change the domain slightly, they just you know fall apart. We're not seeing that with large language models. Yeah, there's this like really interesting paper I was just reading by um, Kenneth Lee and some people at Harvard where they where they sh they take a GPT and they train it fine-tune it I guess on um, lots of examples of Othello the game Othello 
And what they show very convincingly, and then they kind of open up the model and look at the internal activations and do a bunch of analysis. And they show pretty convincingly that just from showing this model, a language model, lots of examples of Othello being played, it is building an internal representation of the board and the board state. And right, it's not just doing some like statistical thing. It actually is learning the concepts of the game and what are legal moves. I think their result, something like it makes, you know, over 99% of the moves that it makes are legal. And so it's learning what's a legal move. How does this, how does this game work? What is a board and, and all this stuff. So, so there's something about this model, these architectures that they really are able to learn concepts and build internal models of the world, which seems like a thing that wasn't really happening before. And it's, it's starting to happen now at this scale that we're at. Um, I think that's just, it totally, it totally changes what you can, what you can imagine an AI can do now. I think. That 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 sounds like very promising research. Um, I I I I do want to mention that there's a very strong hypothesis that language originated out of um, out of uh, uh, spatial problem solving. Uh, you know, many 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 years ago. Yeah, that uh, 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 that humans uh, build up a language capability basically to share information about you know uh, uh threats and predators and food opportunities etc and that language was used to describe these spatial relationships and and that has always given me hope that we can tie the the world around us the 3d world we live in together with the language and i wouldn't be surprised if 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 you really dive in and you look at a Many, many language constructs are actually spatial. Even when we discuss something very abstract, we like to express it in, in spatial. Even when we discuss quantum theory, yeah? quantum mechanics, uh, which is purely math, yeah, we try to say that you know there are different uh, uh, different um, orbits and this and that, and we sort of describe it that way because our language is really good at describing spatial uh, relationships. So there's a hope that LMM, LNMs can be used sort of outside the, you know, outside the straight language space. That's super interesting. So Jonathan, you'd mentioned, um, you know, in this paper, they basically fine tunes a, a, lang a large language model. Um, what what does that what does that actually mean? And kind of to go one level beyond that, um, where do we think the you know the first set of use cases and products that are going to use large language models at scale for both enterprise and consumer? How is that how is that development process that product development process going to look? Is it you know is it constant? Is it taking a model, fine tuning it on a specific use case? or a set of like refined knowledge and then kind of like packaging that in a product or how do you think we're going to see all this unfold? That's a really good question that I think, you know, requires a lot of speculation on my part to answer. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say, so people are already building product. I mean, there's, I, I don't know the count, like easily a hundred startups that are building products on top of other companies' large language models. Not to mention several startups that are um, built around the idea of building their own large language models and building services on top of them. Um, so the the this is a very active world and, and it's certainly happening. Um, you know, I think like the first thing is all, all of what we would call NLP, you know, natural language understanding, you can kind of like replace a lot of it with you just just ask this model to solve your problem. Like like the simplest example of uh, sentiment analysis. You know, rather than training a sentiment classifier, I can just have a movie review. I can just ask my language model, hey, is this movie review positive or negative? And it will tell me. You know, I, I, so I think I think the the easiest use case for all this is just a platform for natural language understanding, you know, task specific natural language understanding. Um, and there's a lot of companies already doing that. Um, yeah, that that's like I, I think I think that's already happening. I think you know going beyond that is a really good question. There's 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 many ways in which these models can be customized and fine tuned. Um, and and maybe just briefly, I, I would say like I, I think of them as in a couple different uh, categories. One is you can teach it a skill. You can teach it like how to summarize a movie better by fine tuning it with like prompt tokens or there's lots of techniques adapters. Um, another is you can kind of change its personality. This is really what like chat GPT is. It's it's the same model, but they, they tuned it based on human feedback. 
um, with this reinforcement learning technique and to change the personality of the model to be more helpful. And then the third is you can teach it new facts. And there's lots of people trying to figure out how do you, know, you take a knowledge base and stuff it into a model. Um, and so I think each one of these avenues opens up lots and lots of new use cases and, and uh, business opportunities. And maybe let Danny respond to. Yeah, uh, I, I, at Unity, we are actually just extremely excited uh, over these uh, developments. Um, just like you want to use uh, a, 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 a game engine to, to, to simulate a self-driving car rather than having a self-driving car driving around in the streets because it's really scary when they do that, no matter what they say. Um, games are, are really awesome to test out new things. Yeah. So while I would be concerned uh, about using uh, a large language model, uh, you know, products like GPT from, from OpenAI uh, for medical <laughs> diagnosis and things like that, um, I would be very comfortable seeing these uh, models being used in gaming. Uh, we have uh, literally billions of people between three to four billion uh, monthly active players playing a game on the Unity platform. Yeah, It's massive use. Uh, some popular games will have 10, 20, 30 million, 50 million users at any moment. Yeah, Just imagine putting a variation of chat GPT behind that, something that used reinforcement learning along with the large language model to, to fine tune its, its interaction with players, with real humans moving around in 3D or trying to solve puzzles or whatever it is, yeah? I mean, like, uh, we're really not going to kill anyone with that, yeah? We're going to be able to push push the boundary uh, on on these models and you're going to be able to push them in new ways yeah and 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 I think that uh, that that's what we're unity I'm super excited about that the whole company is excited about it because it's really going to open the door for NPCs that's non-player characters in games to do stuff that is gonna really interact with people in such a natural way that we have never uh, yeah until recent we actually didn't really believe it would happen there. Eh? That's interesting. I think your comments about the um, kind of like the non-human players in the games, you know, I can think of probably like half a dozen type of simulation type things, whether it's like, well, you might not use it for diagnosing medical things. You might use it for training medical staff because it can throw enough variation at you where you're not having a recycled corpus of scenarios. Uh, like same thing with pretty much any kind of profession, which is all of them that have like a, a very rigid training pipeline. So um, I'm super interested to see how that kind of evolves uh, with the with the startups that are that are working in this space. Is it are they kind of like wrapping product functionality around it for usability, or are we seeing that they're actually taking these foundation models and and trying to fine tune them on top of like expert knowledge? And it, so, like literally just yesterday, I was helping out with like some analytics for in, inside of Gretel itself, and I was like fuzzy on on a certain SQL syntax for like a pivot table and I, I couldn't frame the right question to Google and I was like oh, I'm just gonna let me do this let me ask chat GPT like 35 minutes later like it got me there and I was like wow this is awesome and I I didn't think it knew more than me it kind of helped me with the refresher like but I'm wondering you know is there going to be a point where you're, you're fine-tuning a model to a point where it becomes better at a certain skill set or does a boss character in a video game become virtually unbeatable because it is too good and can adapt to the human player? So like where where does that kind of like education I, I, of the model kind of go? I, I think you really want to see uh, in, in a lot of these cases, what, what, what you want to see is, is in, a, in a sense, you want to see uh, large language models being wrapped into into a certain character yeah you you want them to stay in character in a lot of these cases yeah whether that character is your um your uh, uh side by side coding helping you solve a a a a, a, a coding problem of some kind uh, or whether that is you playing a game and your your you know your wingman or whatever is you're interacting with uh, is, is staying in that role or whether you you meet a virtual uh, virtual Winston Churchill and 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 the character stays in role all the time I think I think I think that's a a fantastic opportunity is something we're already seeing and I also think that uh, uh 
that the whole space has changed a bit. Uh, these models, they, the foundation models, they cost a lot of money to train. So we are getting a little back to um, to old school economics here. Yeah, uh, you it, it's not about being uh, being three smart individuals burning midnight oil and then you can revolutionize the world. Yeah, uh, no, you're gonna you're gonna need you know hundred million dollars to to build this ginormous model. Yeah, and it's gonna take time. But now, when we have these models. I think the big deal is going to be the application of it. Yeah, it's a bit like getting the internet. Yeah, it's the application of it that's that's actually really revolutionizing the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a large language model is really a platform. You know, you, I, I think in reality, the way these the way they will function is you'll you'll build some model that is by definition kind of general purpose, and now that's a platform that you can go take and turn into through the various techniques for customizing it. You know. Something that's really good at, uh, I don't know, writing, writing product summaries or, um, you know, ad copy or something that's really good at helping you code in SQL or whatever it is, you know, whether it's further fine tuning it on task specific data or tuning its personality based on human feedback or somehow injecting more knowledge, you know, domain specific knowledge into it. I mean, a good example is like, you know, these things can all be related to, right? Like, uh, an HR department wants to have a, um, an automated system that can answer questions. So you need to inject it with a whole lot of knowledge and facts, you know, about HR policy. But you also need to put it on rails. There's questions it's not allowed to answer, you know, legally. Um, can't give stock picking it, but, you know, hey, I have a 401k. What should I put? What should I invest in in my 401k? Not allowed to answer that question. So you don't want your automated system to answer that question. So, so you know, there's there's all these like technologies, I think, that need to be embedded. How do you put rails on these things? How do you teach them new facts? How do you give them access to new skills? Um, and I think it's just going to be a question of, you know, as as we, fig we like humanity, figures out how to do each one of these things, um, the platform has more capabilities and it will enable a broad, broader and broader set of use cases. But it seems to me this is like inevitable, right? I mean, the, every, this is such a powerful technology. Everyone is looking at it right now. Um, and clearly it's very, very general framework for, for creating these kinds of AI systems that I, I think, I think we'll look back in, I, I like the analogy of the internet, you know, we'll look back in 10 years and, and these will just be part of the fabric of our lives that we have these kind of AIs everywhere and they're used for you know, everything you can think of. Yeah. Um, is I like I like the internet analogy as well. You also mentioned something, um, Jonathan, about like they are essentially our, our platforms themselves. Um, is it is it overly crude to you know look at like an open AI and its GPT models, very similar to what you know Amazon did for just pure compute resource, right? Like I just need I need eight VMs, I need them now, and I need them. I can run whatever I want on it, but I'm going to put something on top of it. And I don't worry about kind of the underlying infrastructure. Is that are we going to see kind I, of a new wave so. of companies that are kind yeah. of the cloud? I mean, not not to say the cloud compute companies won't offer these LLMs themselves one day, but it seems like there is kind of you know with the open AIs, there is kind of a a different camp of platform providers. I think so. I think it's going to emerge as a new a new kind of platform, like an AI platform, and there'll be a bunch of companies, and it'll be interesting to watch, you know, how it shakes out and who wins and who loses and and then there will be a whole ecosystem built on top of it. I, I think that's what's already starting to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, th I think we should not underestimate the power of, of LLMs as, as a platform. Uh, and I think that uh, we all know that that Amazon, or let's say AWS and, and Azure and GCP and all good cloud and all these guys, they have created a lot of value for themselves. But but remember that the company is running on top of these platforms uh, are also creating vast amount of value. Yeah. So so if you look at company, you know, just let's let's take Facebook as an example. Yeah, it's it's Facebook is just an application running on top of a platform, but Facebook itself has created immense value. Yeah. So I think that uh, that these uh, foundation models are just platforms for uh, for the next uh, unicorns and multi-billion dollar companies uh, that that find these particularly uh, areas of 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 of, of great <laughs> great applications 
based on these uh, foundational models. You know, I mean, one example I think is Gretel. I mean, you know, you can speak to what your company is doing, but it, it seems to me, you know, foundation models are great at generating synthetic data. Uh, sh- surely that's like going to be an important part of, of, you know, that technology stack in the future. So I, I just, I think they're going to be used for everything. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Um, I think one last kind of big uh, topic I'd be interested in covering is um, the computational complexity throughout a pretty big price tag there. I don't know if that was a swag or something, but um, you know, when I, when I think about these models and think about, you know, how much, how much it takes to train them, how based off of that and based off of a future where like, maybe it gets like it pushes into the consumer space. Right. And like, I look at chat GPT, I'm like, man, is this going to replace like traditional search one day? Like am I, and if, if I can't have, you know, first of all, or is there going to be an ad platform built on top of it? Or if not, like, am I going to be talking to my friends and be like, Hey, who's your, who's your AI platform? Like you got your ISP, you got like your cell phone provider, like who's your AI provider. And then like, if it gets into that, like big consumer space, how given the computational complexity, how do we keep those models up to date? Right? Like if I'm asking some tool summarize the news for me, it's got to know what happened yesterday or maybe two hours ago. And um, from what I've seen, a lot of these models, you know, have a pretty hard boundary of like, here's what I know up to. I don't know much past that. And, the things I've tested, it works, right? SQL hasn't changed much in the last year, so I don't have to worry about that. But if I'm asking for something that requires new knowledge, how do we think about constantly training and keeping these models relevant for like really big um, like uh, consumer bases? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's, you know, there's this whole line of research in, into something called retrieval augmentation, where you essentially split. I mean, neural networks are pretty good at memorizing stuff. Um, but that's maybe not the most efficient way to represent knowledge. It's certainly not the most convenient. Um, and so the idea in retrieval augmentation is you have some kind of separate information retrieval system, and then you have a language model that somehow is able to access that information retrieval system to answer a question. So I ask it a question, you know, it starts to look a little more like a search engine. I ask it a question rather than just, you know, thinking inside its own brain to answer, it maybe goes and looks up some information takes the results of that and then synthesizes a response. And, and and so I think that those architectures will probably become very popular for, for the reason you say, you know, it's it's a much more solvable problem how to keep your, you know, information retrieval index up to date. Mm-hmm. We have search engines, we, like we have lots of people, you know, Twitter is solving this problem, Facebook is solving this problem, lots, lots of companies are solving this problem already. Um, the, the question then is just a technical one, you know, how do you, how do you make these systems work efficiently and effectively and do the large language models, you know, interact with these higher systems, but it's a pretty active research topic. And I, and I think it's, it's a pretty like juicy prize, you know, once, once we've solved it. So I suspect it's, it's well, certainly getting a lot of attention. I, I think you're going to see a lot of advances there over the next couple of years. It's very practical. Yeah. I, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that, um, what we're going to see is that a company, uh, companies that provide these, these, uh, underlying models, they are going to get very busy, uh, optimizing, uh, training of these models, renewal of these models, uh, inference is going to be another area where cost is going to matter. And, and they're going to really focus a lot on that, uh, going forward. Um, I think that uh, besides training, inference is the other big area where if you really interact very frequently with these systems, uh, the cost of ev- the cost of dialogue with these systems when when you chat with the system, uh, that cost is 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 going to be uh, be an issue. Uh, it's, it's an area where we definitely are gonna gonna look for optimizations. Um, today, that is entirely backend based. It's entirely cloud based. But we all have pretty powerful devices. Can we shift? I think very important. Uh, I don't know if it's research or engineering, somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah uh, moving probably. part of the inference to the edge will, I think, be crucial for for the economics here. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's going to be a huge intersection of uh, you know big cross functional teams to solve these problems. I don't think it's a zero sum game there. So. Um, that's super, super insightful. Um, and we have just about a minute left. So uh, very quickly for each of you, um, you know, what are you, what's the very next thing that you're most excited about, right? I think it's very easy to pontificate 10 years out, but like, 
what in the next 12 to 18 months do you think is most exciting? And then what's like one blog or research um, type of resource that you might suggest to listeners and watchers on, on how they can kind of keep up with the latest um, LLMs? Oh man, I'm the wrong person to ask that second question of. <laughs> that, is, that, is that answer? Is the answer yourself? Because that's, that's an acceptable answer. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I work with a lot of very smart people who spend all their time doing this. And so the information kind of filters to me that way. I, yeah, I mean, if you try like archive sanity or like these sorts of tools, it's man, it's, it's insane the, the sheer volume of, of research going on right now. Um, uh, I mean, I'm I'm excited. Actually, that this this idea of connecting these systems up to information retrieval, I think, is very exciting. I think that has a ton of potential. Um, and I and I also think this idea of um, tuning these models based on human feedback. I mean, the real innovation of ChatGPT. ChatGPT is like nothing new, except they tuned it based on human feedback to be helpful and chatty. And that made all the difference, right? And just this tiny little change, tiny little technical change suddenly, you know, cha changed this model from this sort of technical thing that only, you know, people in the know, you know, could interact with. And suddenly it's like, Everyone in your grandmother can chat with an AI and recognize how powerful these things are. So I think I think these two technologies are just extremely important, um, and they're going to get a lot of attention in the next year or two. And, and I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of uh, innovation and improvement. How about you, yeah. Danny? Yeah, uh, I, the the immediate development developments that I'm most uh, interested in uh, is uh, tying these large language models to spatial actions. So it can be in a game where you you tell a character to do something using you know language and now it will actually result in 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 that character you know hiding behind something or moving over and getting something very complex actions if if you want to program them but but very easy to to prompt yeah and uh this will have relevance far outside you know out Inside gaming, uh, instructing robots to do things. Today, that's a yeah. very complicated. Uh, there's really been two approaches today. Either you program the robot or use reinforcement learning. But what if you could just tell the robot what to do in a prompt? Uh, so I think that tying large language models to to the world around us, whether it's a virtual world, uh, metaverse, or is the real world. Uh, I think that's that's the next big thing. And 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 I'm not good about. Uh, blog posts and podcasts and stuff like that uh, my my brain works best by just scouring the internet for stuff and then picking it up left and right i actually don't really go to i don't have a go-to source unfortunately fair enough my, the best i do is like i check hacker news you know every other day <laughs> that's that's all i got <laughs> Cool. It makes sense. Um, all right. Well, I think uh, that puts us right at uh, time. Um, I'd like to thank you both so much, uh, Danny and Jonathan, for uh, joining me today. And uh, I'm sure this is uh, super insightful to our audience. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us.